how magnificent is it that we started the day off with a story of a person and their ideology about life and how to move it. Thank you for that beautiful story. And we're going to move into another one, a little bit different, but another gentleman who gives us a lot of food for thought. And this person is a 92-year-old man. He's a small man, and yet he's very well posed and very proud. And he gets up every morning at 8 o'clock, gets fully dressed, shaves himself so that he has a nice smooth face for his day, and fashionably combs his hair. And on this particular day, this elderly gentleman is moving into a nursing home. He's moving there because his wife of 70 years has recently passed away and he has just decided that he is unable to stay alone in the home. And so he sees it as a necessary move and so he takes the action to make that happen. And while he's waiting patiently in the lobby of the nursing home, he's just sitting there waiting and waiting, and it seems to be quite a lengthy time. And yet still, when the aide shows up to guide him to his room, he smiles sweetly at her. And as he's maneuvering his walker to get down the hall to his room, the aide is providing him with a visual description of his room. She says to him, well, it is a tiny space. However, it has nice, clean, fresh sheets on the bed, and it has lovely curtains <coughs> in the windows. And he shouts out with great exuberance, I love it! To which she looks at him questioningly and says, how can you say you love it? You haven't seen it yet. And he says, that has absolutely nothing to do with it. Happiness is something you decide on ahead of time. And then he says, whether I like my room or not, doesn't depend on the things that are in it or even how they are arranged. What it depends on is how I arrange my mind, my mind, my mind, my mind. He says, I have already decided to love it. It's a decision that I make every single morning when I wake up. I can spend the day recounting the difficulties that I've had in my life, including the things I can no longer do, or I can give thanks for the ones I can do. Wow. What a meaningful story that is. Our approach to life is determined by how we choose to arrange our mind. So our title today is Happiness is an Inside Job. And we're going to be talking about both happiness and joy, their differences and similarities. And you can agree or not. You can take them and take the ideas into your own self and determine for yourself what you think about it. But for us, and we have little similar, uh, little similar dif um, differences also. <laughs> for us, joy is the quality of God for which we are, because we are of God, all created to be. So we already are joy. It is our inherent nature, it is the beingness that sits at the seat of our soul it is fully present in every moment. Even though there is no time in God, joy is fully present. And we can choose to experience or not by how we approach our happiness factor. 
how we arrange our mind. So right now, in this very moment of time, we can take whatever is on our mind, whatever is on our plate in life, and we can determine if it's a happy thought, if it's a thought that we wish to have more of or not. Because the more attention we give to it, the more we grow it. And so if it's not, we have the unique power to have a new thought. Now that, to me, speaks of volumes. That means that we are magnificent, incredibly powerful creatures. I read several things this week about happiness and joy, and I was always the, the uh, impression that uh, happiness and joy were synonyms, basically meaning the same thing, but I found out that they really are not. Um, they coincide and they coexist, and they are very similar, and they actually can uh, work independent of each other. And as you don't have to have one to have the other, necessarily. But, um, so it's pretty fascinating, so I thought I'd maybe talk about what's the differences and the commonalities between happiness and joy. We seek happiness from the world around us and feel happiness as we experience the wonders of infinite blessings all around us, but we will never find joy there. It's because happiness is an outward expression and joy is an inward feeling. It's something we feel in our and within ourselves. Happiness is a feeling based on circumstances. Joy is an attitude that defies circumstances. Joy will bring peace and contentment even in the face of unhappiness. Joy will still be there. There's a saying that a person pursues happiness but chooses joy. I prefer to say, say that a person pursues happiness but awakens to joy. It reminds me of that statement in the Bible about knowledge and wisdom. It says, with all you're getting, get understanding. So the idea is that uh, joy is always there. In all of our seeking of happiness, we should get understanding that that is where it actually resides within us. Happiness happens to us, and joy moves through us. Happiness is something we look for. Joy is something that awakens within us. We can be happy with things and possessions, and that's fine, but they never can uh, bring us joy because they are external effects. The happiness we feel is a result of our connection to joy within us. So happiness uh, is like pressing the joy button within ourselves. And that's kind of the point of practicing thanksgiving, as Sandy was talking about earlier. The idea that as we begin to look and see the things around us, we feel the sense within us of being grateful and thankful. And so the things around us, around us are just reminders of an energy that is residing within us. Happiness is fleeting and can end at any given moment because happiness relies on external factors. Joy does not rely on external sensory sources, what we have, or what we see, or what we feel. Joy comes from within. It's an eternal energy. Joy endures hardships and trials and connects with meaning and purpose because it is associated with consciousness, not with effects. I love that. That's an, an important part of it. So, you know, if you've been around for a long time, when we first started this thing, I did a lot of acronyms. I loved acronyms. Almost every Sunday I had an acronym for some kind of word. And I don't know if I've just grown or if this idea came through me just this particular week for no specific reason. But I used to do a lot of, had to tweak those acronyms until they were lovey-dovey and sweetsy and I'm thinking that my acronym for joy, and I didn't go back and look, but I know I made one a long time ago, but I know it wasn't this one that I'm going to give you today. Because this one is a come out and slap you in the face kind of acronym. Joy. Just own yours. Joy. So the question becomes, how? 
How do we just own our own joy? If it is us, and it is part of us, and we're not presently in this moment or a certain moment of time, feeling it, experiencing it, being able to relate to it at the core of our being, how do we change that? Well, first and foremost, it's about recognizing and realizing your divine nature. And then, placing your center of interest on the choice of being happy. Now, this isn't to say that we should just overlook our challenges, because they can be very real, and they definitely feel very real. But it is to say that we want to recognize that we have choices to make when faced with difficulties. And first and foremost, remember principle. In this case, the principle is joy. And we can use it, use joy, to advance our way of life and the way of life that promotes the highest good for us and for those around us. So quite often this means stepping into new territory, which isn't ever what we really, or at least I'll speak for myself, isn't ever what I really love to do, step into new territory. And I shouldn't say ever, because sometimes I'm really glad to get into new territory. But most of us in studies show that change is and can be a challenge. I was recently reminded that if all of us in the room take our problem and write it on a paper and put it in the center of the table and then share, we're each going to want to pull back out our own problem and go with that one. And I was thinking after the conversation, why is that? And I think it's because it's behind us. Our problems are behind us. And they only come back up when we choose to turn around and look at them instead of moving forward into that new territory that I was talking about. So we're in specific territory because we have been well trained since birth to behave and to think in a certain way. And those ways don't always remind us of our joy. In fact, they can certainly bring a sense of unhappiness upon us. And yet, we are not limited by these past trainings. Ernest Holmes tells us there is a power for good in the universe, and we can use it. We can retrain our brain to go first to the mind, to the principle of joy. And that is our power. Therein, within ourselves, is where we become a user. He says again, there is a power for good in the universe, and we can use it. And I've often wondered if people really understand what he's saying with that, use it. In our situation, we're talking about using joy. And we're talking about it in a good way. We're talking about being the user of good. We often hear that, that word in our society as a bad thing. Oh, he's just a user. Yay, a user for good. A power for good in the universe that we can use. And that is our power. We keep our attention on owning the joy by making it real within our own mind first. Making it a reality. Making it then a way of living. And do it until you reveal the feeling of happiness that you are seeking in the present situation. Remembering that every thought is a prayer. So joy is an inner art that directs our happiness. Therefore, your happiness is an inside job. It's requiring you to seek first your unity of origin your natural state of life.
Ernest Holmes wrote, you have discovered the spiritual universe. You are going to have a lot of joy sailing around this world of yours. Don't fight the opinions of others or waste your time arguing over these things. Follow the inward gleam of your consciousness and you will arrive. You will arrive at joy as you follow the inward gleam of your consciousness. You know, sometimes I think that it's really sad how much time people waste in a sense of lack and limitation when right beside that same idea of lack and limitation lies the experience of joy. And yet sometimes that joy is being ignored. Follow the inward gleam of consciousness. Well, I decided I would look up the word gleam and see it. I know what it means, but see if maybe there was a little something more to it that I could go, oh, yes, to. And of course there was. And so gleam in the Oxford Dictionary is defined as a bright light. But the little extra is one reflected from something. A bright light reflected from something. To me, that is saying that that happiness is a reflection of your choice to, to know joy and to know that is who you are. The joy that is the truth of you reflects a light within you. And it's there for you to follow. It leads you down the path of the right and good direction to take your own joy, to just own yours. The way I see it, a joy in life bursts forth into happiness all around us as we hold a consciousness of happiness and let that manifest. And as we let that manifest, we see it, as Deborah said, reflected back to us from our surroundings. And a lot of people have talked about this through history, and I have some fascinating quotes here. Marcus Aurelius says, the happiness of your life depends on the quality of your thoughts. Wow, what a science of mind guy, huh? Long time ago, long before Ernest Holmes. The Dalai Lama, more currently, says, when you realize that everything springs only from yourself, you learn both peace and joy. You created it. And Martha Washington says, I have learned from experience that the greater part of our happiness or misery depends on our dispositions and not on our circumstances. It depends on our dispositions. We know our thoughts create conditions in our lives, and happiness is one of that, one of those. We can choose happiness or we can choose misery. The more we ponder on those things and hold those things in our thoughts, the more we actually create them and experience them. Once again, having them reflected back to us. Hafiz says that ever since happiness heard your name, it has been running through the streets trying to find you. I love that idea. It's something I've held within me all along, and I'm out there searching for it. It's saying, hey, here I am. Here I am. Leo Biscalia says, what we call the secret of happiness is no more a secret than our willingness to choose life. Or in this case, to choose happiness. I love that. The Compassion International Organization has a poem about joy that I'm going to share with you. You can close your eyes or not. The choice is yours. Joy is a little word. Happiness is a bigger word. Joy is in the heart. Happiness is on the face. Joy is of the soul. Happiness is of the moment. Joy transcends. Happiness reacts. Joy embraces peace and contentment waiting to be discovered. Joy runs deep and overflows. 
while happiness hugs hello. Joy is a practice. It's deliberate and intentional. Joy is profound. Joy endures hardship and trials and connects with meaning and purpose. Joy, just own yours. Decide ahead of time to engage joy and arrange your mind accordingly. And to help you this week, we have some handouts that you can take when um, during the offertory. And together, let us affirm this quote from Ernest Holmes. Oh. I, I am a gift of joy that God gives to a wonderful world. Everything necessary to follow the complete expression of the most boundless experience of joy is mine now. And let us read it, now that we know those words, let us read it one more time with great enthusiasm. Like the 92-year-old man said, I just love it. Here we go. I am a gift of joy that God gives to a wonderful world. Everything necessary to the full and complete expression of the most boundless experience of joy is mine now. 